Good afternoon, welcome to another episode of Crying Page by Bonnie Does It. Now today, I'm in beautiful Star County, Texas, deep south Texas, only a few miles from the Mexican border. And what I'm showing you is a parcel of land that has just recently been cleared, probably to make way for cattle pasture. Uh, they also clear a lot of this land both for hunting as well as agriculture. The type of habitat, which you can still see intact on this parcel of property, is known as Tamalipan Thorn Scrub, and it's dominated by a relatively short canopy of mesquite in the genus Prosopis, member of the legume family Fabaceae. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most threatened types of habitat in the continental United States. I mean, there's so little of it left, and with each passing year, more of it gets taken for human development. So when they go in and they bulldoze this stuff, of course, you lose that habitat. You lose it for all the wild animals that live there, but you also lose it for all the plants that live there. And two very rare species of cacti that tend to occupy the tamalip and thorn scrub, this type of habitat, are peyote, lofafra williamsii, and astrophyta mysterious, the star cactus. So I'm going to show you, I actually know a guy who cleared this land. He, he runs a heavy equipment company, cleared this land. I'm going to show you uh, some of the plants that he rescued. He also cares a lot about the native, the native flora of the region, and he does what he can to preserve it. So all the, the plants that otherwise would have just been bulldozed into the ground, they're stuck in a brush pile. You can see they're still burning one over there. He's, uh, you know, rescued dozens upon dozens of plants each time. And uh, we're going to go check out his property and uh, see, see the work he's done and some of the plants that he's conserved and saved that otherwise would have just been plowed under uh, as happened to anything that was growing here. Okay, so we're a little, little ways down the road from that spot I show you where the land had just been cleared with the dozer. And uh, the reason I was showing you that was because all that habitat that just got cleared contained dozens upon dozens of Lophophoras and Astrophyta mysterious, the peyote and the star cactus respectively. And uh, you can see he's doing a pretty phenomenal job of uh, taking care of these. Now, he's not a botanist or anything. He just views peyote as medicine and wants to take care of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, by default, he's uh, engaging in something we call ex situ conservation. It's a way of preserving species, threatened species, uh, outside of their original habitat. You know, so that if, should their habitat get destroyed or plowed under, uh, like, unfortunately, so much land in this region is, for farming, for cattle grazing, etc. It's a way to preserve the plants that uh, otherwise would have been lost, you know. So their home might be uh, destroyed, but, it, you know, acts like this give them, uh, give them a new home. And you could see, you could see star cactus right there in the middle. It's Astrophyta mysterious. That is, that's an especially rare plant, rarer than these uh, peyotes. Okay, now this is, this is basically what botanic gardens do. This is one of their aims, okay? It's a way to, like I said, a way to preserve these plants, okay? And more importantly, to preserve the genetics. So all these will flower, you know, a few days after a rain, week after a rain. You'll get tons of tiny pink blooms. You know, there's got to be 500 plants here. Uh, and he is, he is licensed. He's a member of the Native American church, so don't go getting any funny ideas for any of the snitches in the audience. But uh, he'll, you know, so he'll, these things will bloom. They'll get pollinated, mostly pollinated by, you know, bees and small flies, etc. And then uh, it's a way to make sure that the genes, the gene bank is still uh, being preserved. So you get enough genetic recombination so that you don't go through a population bottleneck, you know, because, like I said, many of these plants, are, they're, you know, increasingly threatened in the wild. Populations are increasingly uh, diminishing uh, as time goes on because, you know, as you may have guessed, uh, what I call the human tumor shows no signs of uh, slowing its exponential growth. This guy's pretty interesting too. Another, uh, another wonderful native plant, Hatropha cathartica, in the poinsettia family. It's not blooming right now. You can see it's got a massive root, a massive caudiciform root. You could call it a lignotuber as well. Uh, but it's got some flower buds right on it there. But when it does bloom, it's these brilliant, you know, pink and and. Uh, kind of like a dark pink and red uh, flowers. There's the leaves right there. Got kind of a palmate, palmate leaf structure. Palmate leaves with the, the undulating margins. Almost kind of con duplicate, you know, folded and keeled and whatnot. But again, that uh, tuber is one of the, uh, that's one of the defining factors of this species. And I've actually seen it in the wild in Bishop, Texas. And it's, it's not a plant you see a lot. 
Okay, my guy tells me he's only seen three of these in his 25 years uh, in this region. Okay, so here at the uh, the exit to uh, Peyote Garden, you know, it's basically a, a living museum of uh, Lofafra Williamsi. Uh, I got uh, Gabby with me here to explain uh, what's going on and uh, how long uh, uh, they've been taking care of this uh, this area. So, uh, okay, do you wanna do you wanna explain how how old are most of these plants? Um, it depends on their size and the hair. Sometimes we think that it's usually like. With the hair on the inside, sometimes when it's a little bit smaller, they're younger. And there's a lot more hair that they're older. The lines around it also make them older, makes them um, more mature, I guess, because the other ones, they're like smaller. So I'm not really sure. And do they, uh, do they all flower at the same time generally when you... Um, when it rains a lot, uh, they flower the next day or... Sometimes in like nice weather it flowers or just randomly they'll just flower. So, so if, really it, if it cools regular. off, if it cools off or if they get rain, how many days after it rains do they normally all pop off? Mm, a couple days, maybe a week, a couple days. It's always been around so we don't want to like have anything destroyed. We want to just take care of it and I mean why not, you know? So your, your first and foremost priority is, is preserving the plants, making sure they don't get destroyed. You know, despite, you know, and these are all here because the habitat uh, has been, you know, bulldozed for pasture or, or yeah. land clearance, basically. Yeah, for anything, the windmills, anything. So. And is there still a lot, a lot of that going on here in Stark yeah, County? Yeah, tons of it. Tons of it all the time, all the time. And most of the ranches, they're always, always, always having, like, a lot of maintenance around. Always, always cleaning or always doing something. So that's why, I mean, it's everywhere. Here at least. Are you worried about you know the? I mean, I guess you you've been never here. Never going extinct. You're all, yeah. Yeah. At sometimes. least or locally extinct. You know. Yeah. With, where with, we can't get to it or we can never see it again. Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, we never know. You know. I mean, there's so many people, but at the same time, like, what could we like do more? You get me? We try, but I mean, it's hard. It's really hard when it comes to something like that. So it's it's in a way it's up to private landowners to protect this species and make sure that it thrives and. Yeah, it always depends on the people too, because I mean, if the landowners say no, you can't really do anything about it, so. Right, right. And do most people, are most people supportive of it, would you say? Sometimes. If, if you know how to like talk to the person, if you try to explain it, if they want to hear you out, it's really easier to be able to like get to it. But if not, then it's really hard. And uh, as far as, you know, when these things flower, I mean, what, what do you see pollinating them? You see mm. bees on them or? Ants, maybe. There's usually like always a bunch of ants all around them. I mean, it's always little bugs on the ground. I really don't know if it's bees or anything like that. I've never seen a bee on top of a flower or anything. But they do produce fruit and it, it, what's it look like? Like a pink chili pepper? The, the little seed that you're talking about, it's, it's a little pocket. It grows after the flower. So the flower falls off and then um, it's a little pocket and... Like a little pink... Uh... Yeah, and there's little dots inside. Those are the seeds we think. The little black dots. Yeah, those yeah. are the, the seeds. You know, it's really, I mean, I, I got to say, it's remarkable you guys are doing this because, you know, I mean, what you, like I said, what you got here, this is, you know, something they call ex situ conservation. It's a way to preserve preserve rare plants outside of habitat, you know, so while their habitat is getting knocked out and bulldozed. Yeah, we you know, try to make it as natural as possible. We just put it in our ground and make sure it looks kind of around cactuses and stuff how it grows because it likes to be covered up sometimes we notice that it grows when there's more shade they like to be like like um what are they called Scondidas. um hidden. hidden they like to be hidden sometimes under cactuses and under trees and stuff so it's hard to get to them too right so they're not getting fried by the sun yeah not really no. now these these star cactus down here these guys you would you say these are more rare than the peyote yeah definitely very rare there's some over there too those are extremely rare. Those grow yellow flower, huge yellow flower. Right. I don't know much about those, but those are rare tamian. When they, when they flower, they don't flower as often as these. These are more pinky purple flower, and they flower more often, a lot more often. So these 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 peyotes will flower, and they get pollinated. Then they put out that little pink yeah. knob-looking thing. That's the fruit. And how about how how soon after they flower does that little pink fruit appear? Uh, right after. I, I feel like it's right after. A week or right, two? Yeah, right after. It should be right after, like, it falls off the flower. 
or it's, the flour one should be shriveled up and make its own little pot. So. It's great. Well, Gabby, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. He's even got, he's got some nice embellishments too. You can see he's got the little garden gnomes to make it complete. And even, even more interesting. Oh, look, it's Mammillaria hyderi. Another wonderful native. We got our own little uh, native plant uh, preservation center right here. You can see that uh, that uh, oyster shell right there. That's actually a fossil, you know. And those are abundant in the region too. I believe, I believe they're roughly Eocene, Eocene or Oligocene. So, you know, 50 million to 30 million years old. Back when the uh, back when the Gulf came all the way uh, all the way this far inland. You know, and you'll find them. I mean, I found those on the on a ridge above the Rio Grande, uh, just a little ways west of here. Just you know, dozens of them. I mean, this is a wonderful case. You know, and this is just a private citizen who cares about the plants in his region, taking good care, being a good steward of uh, of the ecology and the, the plant community that uh, again is is so threatened here. Here we go. Here's a nice assortment of uh, peyotes and then, of course, the much rarer star cactus, Astrophytomus theories. Now, Astrophytomus theories is very common in cultivation. Uh, you know, nurserymen in Japan and uh, Thailand just, you know, they, they work wonders with these things, breed all kinds of weird cultivars, variegated cult cultivars and what they should. But it's, uh, you know, it's odd because this is another plant where there's far more in cultivation than there are left in wild habitat. And this, again, is a you know, you'll see this plant growing uh, just on these flat, muddy, um, yeah, kind of like highly, highly, where I've seen them, highly alkaline, highly, highly saline soils. And they just, uh, you know, no, no uh, cover of mesquite. They're not growing beneath the canopy, though they can. But I've seen them where they're just growing out in the open and they kind of recess into the mud. And they grow with another plant, a member of the sunflower family, a succulent member of the sunflower family, uh, which is pretty weird. Uh, to anyone who's familiar with that family, but it does happen. Uh, and they grow with this other plant on the sunflower family called Varia Texana. V-A-R-I-L-L-A. So anyway, so this this guy is a, I guess he got this eight years ago. They were clearing a fence line, but the plant is obviously far older than that. I mean, these things grow, you know, incredibly slow, at least in habitat. You know, in cultivation, they're going to grow a lot faster. You fertilize them. You provide them with warmth year-round. You make sure they're not getting fried by the sun and they're not getting too chilly. You keep them at the right temperature and they'll do great. But in habitat, they uh, it's a little bit, uh, they get a little bit rougher of a go. There you go. Beautiful, beautiful indigo snake. These guys actually keep the rattlesnakes away. They're a non-venomous alternative to the uh, rattlers. Beautiful guy right there. Oh, yeah. You know, it looks a little scary, but... Uh, Overall, good to have around. Because if you got these, you're not going to have diamondbacks. Oh, there he goes. He wants to go in his home. Oh, he's just going through the wall over there. There she is. There. What, what a beautiful girl over there. Massive and somewhat, you know, she's uh, somewhat uh, terrifying. But you just got to keep in mind they're non venomous and a, a minor bite is not going to kill you. Okay. And she has not been, a, she's not been aggressive whatsoever. She's. Just, she's probably, you know, I'm probably bumming her out pretty bad right now. I feel bad, but uh, what a gorgeous snake. And again, these guys, they eat the rattlesnakes. They'll keep them away, okay? You know, kind of like a, a, a territorial thing. There she goes. She got a nice home right there. Look at that. All right, see you later. Sorry for bothering you. So here you can see this is this is more the, the actual native habitat of the peyotes. You can see just coming up under a, you know, bright shade a light canopy of uh of prosopis of mesquite there's mike he's over there looking for something to be in but uh you know so what 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 the what the landowner was trying to do with that uh that ex situ uh, conservation uh, spot for the loaves is just give them you know kind of mimic the same conditions okay growing in the shade because you know here in the rio grande valley the sun is too hot too brutal in the summer for them to just be straight exposed there's other areas where you'll see them they're not growing in this kind of silty alluvial deposits of the of the old alluvial deposits of the Rio Grande. They'll be growing, you know, like in West Texas. There's one or two populations out there where they'll be growing, you know, actually embedded in in hard limestone. Much different habitat, but uh, you know they're doing fine. You know, they normally have some brush coming up around them to shade them a little bit, but other than that, they're exposed. You know, but here this is 
another one of the main types of habitat. Like I said, just you get these open, exposed canopies of uh, misky. You know, just kind of dappled, uh, dappled light. Okay, very pleasant to hang out under. Not a nice uh, population over here. Again, growing beneath the mesquite, the prosopis, St. Patrick plants to be at a species of Celtis, Cannabaceae, one of the hackberries. It's the, the Tomalip and Thorn Scrub version of a hackberry. You can see multiple plants. None of them too big, but they're just, you know, they're obviously reseeding themselves, doing quite well for themselves, if I may say. Some little guys over here, probably you know, only four or five years old, maybe. You can see healthy population, self sustaining, reseeding itself. What's going on, Mike? How you doing over there? Anyway, uh, over here, we got uh, a couple little guys. You got some recruitment, probably only three or four years old. So, you could see, I mean, it's a self sustaining population. You give them what they, you give them what they need. Uh, they do all right for themselves, you know, so this is, that's how this plant was able to be used for medicine for so long uh, without, you know, drastically impacting the populations. It's just when you take too much and then the uh, the habitat gets, you know, just drowned in invasive buffalo grass, which again wasn't here, you know, even a hundred years ago. You know, it just it's, it requires proper land management and awareness of uh, conservation of these plants. Look at this guy. Again, I can't get over how tiny that guy is. Okay, and of course, you know, once it, once this soil gets wet, there's no there's no rock on the surface, you know, which again is quite different from the populations of this plant in West Texas, and there aren't many, you know. But this, once it gets wet, it just kind of turns into this uh, this mushy, sandy loam, and that's how the seed uh, takes off, you know. So and again, it never really freezes here. Uh, it's hot as hell in the summer. It's still hot in mid October, and uh, once those uh, you know, they flower and then you get these little chili, pink chili pepper looking fruits. And, uh, you know, rodents probably eat the flesh and discard the seeds. Little black poppy seed looking things. And then the seeds just kind of lay in the soil. And then once that soil gets wet, it'll stay wet even when the rains stop, you know, for a few hours or a few days afterwards. And uh, that's how these plants get established. It takes active awareness of the plant and you know proper conservation of the land to make sure that these uh these plants are still with us in you know 50 to 100 years you know and hopefully they will be hopefully it's not going to be one of those plants where there's more in cultivation than there are uh, in habitat oh that's nice uh, evidence of a prior human habitation okay look at that Old stone tools chipping that was, I mean, this is obviously, it's a piece of agate. It was obviously chipped by someone. So people have been here for, there goes Mike. People have been here for a very long time. And, you know, it's quite possible. I would say it's quite likely that they were cultivating uh, the peyote here, obviously. You know, and maybe the uh, the star cactus too. You know, these have been, these have been revered and well-respected plants for a long time. And uh, you can see evidence of the people who used to uh, take care of them. Okay, so the important thing to take away from this is not just the, you know, oh, the eye candy of seeing rare and endangered, in this case, psychoactive cacti. But uh, the important thing to take away from this is, you know, what, what concerned people can do who actually give a shit about their regional flora and their regional wildlife, you know, and it can just, by default, end up uh, giving it a refuge, you know, in a storm of human development, what I call the human tumor. Uh, and continued, you know, amidst continued habitat loss and uh, overdevelopment. Because it's not stopping anytime soon, you know. We're going to have the uh, the privilege, if you can call it that, of watching many of these plants, many of these plant species that I frequently show you be knocked out of existence in our lifetimes. Okay, people always talk about climate change this, climate change that. Habitat loss, in my opinion, is a much bigger threat. And it's just a byproduct of... Uh, of rampant overdevelopment, you know, of a species that takes and takes and takes and gives nothing back, takes everything for itself. Anything that doesn't directly benefit human beings is going to be thrown under the bus, you know, unless uh, concerned people, people who care, uh, take care of it. So, oh, look at that. We, we got some rain this morning and uh, you got the flower just starting to come up. The flower's just starting to pop off. 
couple of them flowering already. You know, they must, it's a pretty quick response time. You know, yesterday it was nice. It was like a, you know, a chilly 80 degrees. <laughs> but, uh, you know, prior to that, for weeks before that, it's been, you know, upwards of 95, 97 degrees in the rain. I mean, just fucking unbelievable, you know, especially for me. I've been bathed in that uh, nice maritime climate, you know, for too long over there in Oakland. And then before I came down here, I was in Chicago. You know, beautiful fall weather, 65, 70, and then down here, it's fucking 97 in mid-October. So, anyway, point being, they respond almost immediately to the rain. You know, those cactus roots, of course, just soak up water like a sponge, like a dry sponge, and uh, they're already starting to bloom. That's pretty quick, you know. And again, all these that you're looking at now would have been uh, wiped out. They would have just been bulldozed. Bulldozed along with the mesquite and the other uh, plants of the region, the tamalip and thorn scrub that they grow in. So, anyway, there you go. He's doing a wonderful job here. And, uh, you know, thank God. Thank God someone's doing it. You know, there's a couple other landowners in the region I've met who are, uh, you know, not keeping it conserved to this extent. But, uh, you know, but they, they care for it. They take care of it. They make sure uh, plants are protected, you know. And uh, this, is, this is certainly what we need more of. We need people... You know, conserving their regional flora because, like I said, the tumor's not going to stop growing anytime soon, and uh, it's going to for the the remainder of uh, of our lives at least. Plants are going to continue to be threatened in habitat. So, and especially this is one of them, a highly sought after cacti, the highly sought after cacti star cactus peyote. You got your copia poas down there in Chile that get poached like hell by the. Uh, you know, people come from overseas to rip them out the ground. And and then, of course, just good old habitat loss and land clearance, you know. We'll end it with a nice money shot of this massive old uh, grandpa peyote, this massive old bastard. Okay, from the beautiful Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. That's all I got for you today. Go fuck yourself, bye. What are you doing? You can't hang out here. What are you doing? You're going to end up smushed. You got to go back on the other side. You got to go back on the other side. Come on, let's go. What are you doing? You got to go back over here. Okay? Goddamn right. Go first, Berlander, right? Come on. I know you don't like it. I know it's all, you got the grass and everything, but you can't hang out in the road. You're going to end up smushed, okay, guy? I'll put you down right there. Or maybe you, you know what? Maybe you, I'll put you on the other side of the road where you were going. You can't hang out in the road. Here, look, i help you cross, help you cross over, okay? know where you're going is this good here we'll put you down we'll put you down right there huh that good you like that i right, don't hang on the road